Welcome to this episode of Vault Culture. In this podcast, we'll take you on a journey where you will discover that at the junction of tech and copyright, while we are living in a digital age with unlimited potential, many walls have come up, making it more difficult for users and creators to access, share and reuse what is available online and offline. The journey will take many stops, interviewing a variety of people ranging from internet entrepreneurs to librarians, from digital rights activists to sci-fi writers. And we'll ask them how copyright and tech affect their daily lives. In this episode, our guest is Rebecca Giblin. Rebecca Giblin is a future fellow and associate professor at the Melbourne Law School in Australia. Her work sits at the intersection of law and culture, exploring how regulation, uh, particularly copyright regulation, impacts the creation and dissemination of our, of our heritage. She leads the Author's Interest Project, where Giblin and her team are investigating ways in which taking seriously the author's interest in copyright can improve not only their remuneration, but in doing so, reclaim a great deal of currently lost cultural value. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, Gwen. Hi. So, um, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, We hope you're okay. Um, We've heard you're in the... We heard you're in lockdown. Uh, that's uh, right. Very... <laughs> Here in Melbourne, I think we're about 207 days into lockdown over the last 18 months. So it's very nice to be talking to you for something different. <laughs> okay, that's good. That's great to hear. Well, let, let's get started. So um, the copyright discourse routinely pits creators against users, but your research centers squarely on making copyright work better for both. So for, for the users, but also for the creators. Can you uh, explain us what made you decide on this focus? Well, Gwen, I grew up in a house that really didn't have many books in it. And I was one of those kids that was always really hungry for things to read. Um, I'd go to great lengths to find books. Um, I'd go down to the local charity shop and there was one volunteer who was a really soft touch and I'd be able to kind of negotiate them down to like five books for four cents. Um, Libraries were obviously really, really important, school libraries and public libraries. And, you know, it was books that transported me and libraries and authors are the reason that I grew up to be able to write books of my own. And so it's pretty obvious really why my entire career, it's about uh, 15 or 16 years now, I've been working on these issues that are about um, putting both creators' interests but also the uh, the broader social interest in access to knowledge really front and centre. And that's why I find it so frustrating that copyright, which is supposed to be helping us achieve both of those two things, does such a terrible job very often of both. So, Rebecca, you've spent the last five years leading research into reversion rights. Can you explain us a bit what, what are they and why they are so important to you? Um, I have to say I've never heard of it, so I'm very curious about um, your answer to this. Yeah, it's it's interesting because a lot of people ask me this question and especially why have you decided to spend five years of your life focusing on this thing that so few people have actually heard of? Um, and I'm very excited to evangelize about it. Um, copyrights routinely get transferred from creators to investors and that's normal and desirable because very often investors do need exclusive rights in order to be able to commercialize culture. Uh, Those copyright transfers are often the full copyright worldwide for the entire term, which um, in Europe and the US and Australia can it is often the life of the author plus another 70 years after that. So we're talking about maybe 100 years of rights. Now, if we understand the investor perspective, it's very simple. They want the rights, all the rights, just in case this thing that they are commercializing turns out to be the new Mickey Mouse or Jack Reacher or Billie Eilish. Mm-hmm. Um, but nearly always it's not, right? Um, nearly always the work uh, will have a fairly short commercial life. In the case of books, for example, it's sort of between one and five years. After that, nearly all of the books have sort of finished their commercial life. Uh, but like we said, the transfers might be for a 100 years. And so the, the transfer outlasts the interest of the investor in nearly every case. And that's the cause of orphan works. 
right? That's why we have this situation where there's so many works that um, perhaps cultural institutions or users want mm-hmm. to be able to access, um, but they cannot because there is still a copyright, but that person is either not locatable or not interested in making it available. So it, th- those long transfers that are awarded um, regardless of whether the person knows they own the rights, whether they're interested in exploiting them, that really does have a big effect in walling off culture. So what reversion rights are about are letting creators reclaim their copyrights, which then lets them decide what they want to do with them next. And of course, uh, in the digital era, there's lots and lots of options, um, which might be, you know, say if we're talking about a book, it might be that they um, make the book available online via um, uh, platforms like Kobo and Kindle, um, do that directly. They might reach a new deal with the same publisher that gets them a fresh advance and so a little bit more money. Um, Perhaps there's a new publisher who's more excited about actually making that title available ongoing. Um, reversion rights have been around actually longer than modern copyright. We found uh, a contract that predated the Statute of Anne that had a reversion clause in it, allowing the author to get their rights back. But the Statute of Anne, which was the world's first copyright statute in 1710, it was also um, had reversion built in from the beginning because rights lasted for 14 years. And then if the author was still alive after that point, then they would get them for another 14 years again. And the intention there was that they would be able uh, to um, to sell them again to the publisher. Uh, in the US, and you might actually uh, realize, a lot of the US listeners might realize that they know this by another name, it's called termination rights. Um, and there is a, a statutory right to terminate after about 35 years um, in the United States. But lots of other countries uh, don't have any statutory rights about mm-hmm. that at all. Um, and look, th- this is why I think debates about expanding copyright really need more nuance because Um, very often those expansions benefit copyright owners rather than copyright creators. So if we take again that uh, 20-year term extension that was rolled out, as I said, in Europe, the US and Australia to extend copyright from the life plus 50 years to life plus 70 years, um, in nearly all cases that benefited the owner of the copyright, not the creator of the copyright. So those additional rights went to the the, the person or the company that happened to own those rights rather than the one that actually created it in the first place. And these term extensions not only then did very little to actually get more money in creators' pockets, but because they didn't impose any reciprocal obligations to make content available, they also massively worsened the orphan works problem. Uh, because it was even longer then um, during which these rights were being held up by people that, you know, very often were not interested in exploiting them. Okay, thanks Thanks for clarifying that. By the way, I forgot to mention you get bonus points every time you mention Waltz <laughs> in, your, in your answer. So, <laughs> Oh, well, let me say one more thing about reversion rights too, and that is that I'm not the only one excited about them, even if maybe not everybody's heard about mm-hmm. them yet. Um, it is like we're really starting to see a growing momentum um, uh, uh, of policymakers around the world getting excited about the potential of these rights to help us fix some of copyright's most intractable problems. So, for example, the 2019 European Digital Single Market Directive, it has a bunch of author protective um articles in there. And one of them is a use it or lose it, right? It requires member states to uh, give new rights that would allow authors and performers to reclaim their copyrights in the event that they're not being commercially exploited uh, by the rights holder. Um, So that's really, really exciting. And that's being implemented at the moment. We also saw in Canada, they have had, uh, since uh, the early 1900s, they have had an automatic reversion right after 25 years after the author dies, um, those rights can be automatically revert to the author's heirs. Uh, But thanks to uh, uh, advocacy from a bunch of authors and academics um, and those creators, including Brian Adams, who was really front and center of this, there's recommendations now for Canada to create a new time-based reversion right, which would be after a flat 25 years, so much quicker than the one that they've got now. And South Africa as well, um, they did, their parliament did pass a law for an order 
automatic reversion right after 25 years. Um, that didn't get uh, signed into law by the president, uh, but that's something that they're really keen to explore, partly to address this uh, problem that so many uh, South African creators had their rights stripped away from them, um, particularly by um, um, white-owned corporations at a massive undervalue, and they see reversion rights as a way of trying to level the playing field and allow those creators mm. and their heirs to um, not only regain control over that work, but to make some more money and hopefully make that culture more available to the people who need it. Mm. Okay, great, thanks. That's clear. But imagine we get this right. So imagine like worldwide well, it might be a long stretch but imagine we really get this 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 right can you uh, give some more examples about, about what opportunities can be unlocked by this oh, yeah. um, or what what kind of chances we are now missing that we might have if we get this right yeah absolutely um maybe i could start by just telling you a little bit about some of our recent research we looked at um, we we did the the first study that's ever been done internationally across countries to have a look at the relative availability um, of books to libraries, so uh, uh, as ebooks for for e lending, um, and we wanted to understand how is the copyright term affecting availability. So we identified a sample of culturally important books in English language markets, and then we accessed. Um, uh, we access data through Overdrive, which is the, the leading sort of e-lending aggregator. And we looked at the availability of these books in different markets. So what we wanted to see um, was how available they were in the US um, and Canada and Australia and New Zealand. And um, what we found is that the books were significantly less available and more expensive in the US and Australia, which is where the terms are life plus 70, than in Canada and New Zealand where they were life plus 50. So what that suggested to us, and, and you know, we'd controlled for other factors, and what that suggested was that that longer copyright term was actually getting in the way um, of the books being available. But maybe, you know, for me, maybe the, the most startling thing that we found was that so many really important books were missing from all of those markets, regardless of the copyright status. Um, and that says that these books are depreciating um, long before um, the copyright terms actually expire. Um, and look, we simply can't afford to lose that culture. And so getting reversion rights will both help make creators um, be able to make more money, which is really, really important, but it will also simultaneously help us uh, reclaim a lot of the culture that's lost under current approaches to copyright if we were to get it right. And so let me tell you now about another real life example. And I know I'm talking a lot about uh, books. I should make it clear that um, reversion rights are not limited to books. They're also really important mm -hmm. in other contexts, particularly for music. Um, and there are a few uh, reversion rights out there in the music space. It's just that uh, my empirical sandpit happens to be books, and so that's <laughs> where I've done most of my work. Uh, but let me tell you, uh, having having said that, let me tell you about um, a new project that I'm super excited about that I think really gets to the nub of why reversion is so exciting if we do manage to get it right. Um, so this is a new collaboration with libraries and authors, and it came about from the fact that look, most of Australia's literary heritage is, is lost. You know, it's, it's out of print um, and it's never been digitised. So we've got a few sort of um, copies perhaps mouldering away in libraries, uh, but there's a real risk that lots of important books could be lost forever. And we don't have any statutory reversion right here, unlike the US, as I mentioned, which means that we need to rely, um, in order to get rights back, we need to rely on the contracts. And in book publishing, very often, they do have clauses uh, called out-of-print clauses that allow authors to terminate once the title's no longer available. Now, there are lots of problems with um, out-of-print clauses in the contracts, um, and we've documented those in our research as well. But um, we decided that despite those problems, we were going to set out to rescue 200 of the most important of these lost books. Um, and so we, um, 
we were working with libraries and every single state and territory library in Australia is now a partner in this and uh, nearly all of them have provided money uh, to help us digitize these books because they see how incredibly important it is. But like once the, uh, and, and so I should say these books also, so these are all books that are out of print. They're all books that have been sort of lost from commercial circulation, um, but that the authors have exercised their reversion clauses in their contracts and they've got their rights back. Um, what we're doing is we, um, after we digitize these, we, we, we sign contracts with the authors in order to have the, the right to digitize their books. Um, and once we've got them scanned and up to a library quality, we're going to be licensing them into public libraries for lending out to their patrons as ebooks. Um, and they're also going to be available for sale as ebooks too. And not only are the libraries, um, you know, just thinking about thinking about what's at issue here. Um, often, when we talk about reversion rights, the pushback that we get from investors is, "Oh no, don't worry your head about that because you know those rights aren't worth anything. Um, nobody would want to use them anyway." And already we're seeing that that's absolutely not true. You know, the, the libraries have fronted money from very scarce bu budgets to digitize these books because they see the value and they think that they're so important. They're also putting up money for license fees so that they can pay the authors when these books are borrowed. Um, and we're also seeing that there's other commercial demand. Uh, there's commercial interest in um, from, from companies in investing in um, making these books available in print form, which is terrifically exciting, also as audio books for some of them. And we're seeing as well that now that we're getting to have digital copies, there's things like schools and cultural institutions that want to license some of these books as well. Um, what's really exciting about this is that it's not just that we're going to digitize the books and then, you know, they're going to kind of sink or swim. Um, there's two other really important cultural pieces to this. First of all, um, in Australia, we've got something called a national e-deposit scheme through our national library, which um, it's, an, it's a scheme whereby every e-book that's published gets deposited in our sort of national preservation system so that it will be available forever. So we're, we're not just digitizing these books, but we're making sure that they're going to be available for as long as we do have libraries, which I hope is a very long time. Mm -hmm. The second thing that's really cool about this is that libraries won't just be licensing these books, but they're going to be putting their heft behind promoting them to their audiences, to their readers, and giving these really important books a chance at getting um, a new readership or new generations of readers as well. Um, this is all going to provide the springboard for some really important research that we're doing into the value, the economic value. This is with um, uh, my colleague, Dr. Paul Crosby at the Macquarie University and uh, Imke Reimers at um, Northeastern. Uh, we are wanting to understand the economic value of reversion rights. We're also really excited to understand the relationship um, between the libraries lending out ebooks and um, publishers selling them, you know, is, is Amazon has been whispering in publishers' ears lately that they shouldn't be licensing their ebooks to libraries because it hurts sales, uh, but they are the ones that control the sales data that would allow us to tell whether that's true or not, and they don't release that. So this will be the first independent research to really rigorously look at that question, and it'll also allow us to tell um, what is the economic value of library promotion of books. So it's really exciting for all of those reasons, but I think it also just beautifully shows the potential of reversion rights to help it better achieve copyright's aims of making culture available and getting creators paid. Um, and if you are interested, if people are interested um, in hearing a little bit more about that project, they could have a look at untapped.org.au for more details. But it's definitely one that's very close to my heart and that I'm really excited about. And it just makes me think that, you know, at the moment, this project is is very, very difficult and very, very expensive because of um, the complexities of having to negotiate these rights reversions with publishers. We do have an incredible uh, research fellow on the project, Dr. Ellie Lawson, who um, is a literary sociologist and has worked in publishing for a very long time. And it's thanks to her that we're able to do this at all. Um, but we can see how much more we could do with these resources if mm -hmm. it were simpler um, and clearer reversion rights um, that authors could rely upon. Okay, so 
I imagine these reversion rights would be a very big part of, of um, your, um, how shall I say, reimagined copyright. And I'm, I'm, of course, I'm asking this because you've written a book, a book that's, uh, um, says that's called reimagined copyright or what if we could reimagine copyright i'm i'm wondering if you have any other uh, things that you want to touch upon that would be like in if you could start from a blank slate and if you had to reimagine or reinvent copyright from the start like what would be in it what be, would not be in it um, mm. how would you uh, how would you go on about it like can, can you explain us a bit about that well, look, we really, in my view, we really need to just go back to basics and ask the question, what do we actually want it to achieve? Um, and realign it to do just that. The thing is, there is an enormous amount of money sloshing around the culture industries, but right now very little of it trickles down to the people who actually make that culture. Uh, there are aspects of copyright, and I'm thinking about international music licensing in particular, that are absolutely bonkers. Like if I if I sat here and tried to explain how ludicrous this system is and how much wastage there is, people probably just wouldn't believe me. But if you trace the rights flows, you know, just from something um, that is as routine and day-to-day -day as people using a music streaming service like Spotify, if you trace the money and the rights flows from country to country and see where it gets eaten up and who ends up with what and how long it takes, it is just simply bananas. You would never design a system like that if we were starting from scratch today. So I think really sitting back, thinking about you know, what actually are we trying to achieve here? And how can we do it better than these systems that are just incredibly wasteful, both f in terms of what creators get, but also in terms of what the public gets, in terms of that ongoing access to knowledge and culture? Um, that's where I'd really, that, and, and that's where our book really focuses. Um, the other thing that we really need to do is to, and, and this is a practical thing that we need to do if we're ever going to be able to sit down and ask those questions and get meaningful answers that we can actually implement, is we need to address the problem of concentrated corporate power. And Corey Doctorow and I have just finished writing a book about this that's going to be out next year. Um, one of the big reasons and under-recognized reasons why creators earn so little and why so much culture is tied up um, without public benefit is because these supply chains are colonized by powerful corporations that co-opt most of its value for their for their own um, shareholders' good. Now, creators shouldn't have to choose between big content and big tech. Neither of them have their interests at heart. And similarly, society shouldn't have to um, rely on the crumbs that big content and big tech are willing to give us. We do have alternatives. And in order to access them and to do a better job, we need to cut at that corporate power and we need to form new alliances that bring people together, united over these common interests, which are, of course, to make sure that our amazing creators are recognized and rewarded for their work and that that work can be made available and made available ongoing so that all of us can benefit from it. This interview it will appear on a blog called World Culture. Um, you've already discussed in your in, in the intro. You've already said like what 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 made you interested in in copyright and and, and books and and how this all works. But um, we also ask our guests um, what was there like any particular moment or can you share a particular moment where where you actually hit the wall and and you thought like okay there's something wrong here. Uh, this is not right. Um, I'm, I'm, we're very curious about what are the what are like the specific moments when our guests um, saw the light. If I, if I can uh, can uh, phrase it like that. Um, look, uh, I, I like to think I've always seen the light, but for me, there was a, a real there was a real moment uh, in. I think it was 2016, and I was just. I'd grown so incredibly frustrated with the copyright discourse all around the world, but uh, particularly here in Australia, which kept using creators as stalking horses 
to mask other people's economic interests. So there was this poisonous discourse that was really putting creators out front and center, but in a way that was only going to benefit others and at a cost that was incredibly high for the rest of society. And there was a day, I think a day, where I just completely lost my tolerance with this and I started rage writing this grant application, which was all about, well, what would happen if we actually took creators' rights seriously instead of just holding them up as a shield for others? What kind of thinking could that unlock, you know, for getting them paid and for helping us reclaim this lost culture? And uh, very fortunately, um, that grant application was successful and uh, was funded by the Australian Research Council, uh, as well as my university. And we have had the, the privilege of spending four years now working exclusively on these issues. That has been one of the great privileges of my career, and it has unlocked really different ways of doing things and new alliances. Um, and I suppose... I'm really glad that that day came because it did give us the resources to dig into these questions properly. And I would love to see um, more people follow on uh, and do uh, similar work. Great. My traditional closing question is also like, what can we do to make it better? But I think this entire episode of this podcast was focused on some very practical and concrete ideas about um, about what uh, what we can do to fix copyright and to, to break the walls and, and to make the entire system work for both for creators and for and for users um, but that leaves me with with uh, let me rephrase my closing question then and, and let me ask like what should 2030 the year 2030 look like and and maybe also like what will it look like of course on copyright uh, on uh, when we're talking about copyright maybe like look into the future a bit and and can you predict what's going to happen or uh, and say what you want to happen i think we yeah, have yeah i, I, that, I don't, what will I, happen i don't think i want to predict what will happen because <laughs> that's too depressing um l let me say what i would love to see happen i would love to see new alliances. Um, I would like to see creative workers really see themselves more as workers and unite with other workers in this shared struggle that we have, particularly against concentrated corporate power. Um, and I would really like to see new alliances between people and organisations that you know, in, in the copyright discourse over the last 20 years have been pitted as enemies, but have very much uh, commonality. So I'm thinking, for example, of book authors and libraries and visual artists and galleries. Um, very often in copyright, that people are told to pick a side. And look, it's just not helpful for moving things forward and finding shared ground um, and the, the, the room for achievable change. And so what I'd really like to see as well is growing those alliances, finding those shared interests and working together to make this make this much better. Great. Break the walls and find common find a common interest. That's a nice uh, that's nicely in team with uh, nicely in touch with the team of the podcast actually. Well Rebecca actually I've I've gone through my questions. Thank you very much for being so um, clear and concise and, and you know very uh, an excellent guest um, but before we uh, before we leave I would love, just like to ask you uh, is there anything else you'd want to you'd want to share you want the audience or the podcast oh. to know or... I, think, I think that's I think that covers it pretty much okay that's perfect that's great yeah. so um Thank you very much for taking time. I found it very interesting, uh, and I've, I've learned uh, I've learned a couple of new uh, new terms. So that's uh, it was uh, interesting on a personal level as well. Um, so um, for our listeners, we will um, we will paste some of the links that Rebecca mentioned. Uh, we will make sure to have it in the in the comments section under this blog, so you can uh, that would be really can, great. Uh, well, check it out the, for yourself. The research papers would be terrific. Um, yes, and yes, things yes. like the Untapped website. Yeah, and the box of us, of course, as well. Mm. Uh, I think the, many people are looking forward to uh, to the publication of uh, of your book with uh, with Corey Doctorov. Um, he yeah. was also a guest on the show, so um, uh, I'll make sure that we have the link there as well. 
So thank you very much. Thank you, Gwen. 